because the, the whites ran them from the schools. They were barred from going to the public schools in this province. So, so that's important for us to hear now and yeah. to um, burst the bubble of sort of the illusion that mm -hmm. we have that Canada is, is, um, is uh, somehow uh, more enlightened than the U.S. Yeah. around these issues. Yeah. It's not. This is yeah. really, I mean, you know, we, we, they weren't called the black codes here in Ontario, but it was basically like a black code situation mm -hmm. in terms of racial segregation um, for, for the black community and the struggles that they had to, to endure every day on a daily basis. Um, that actually feeds back into another question I had. Um, in, our, in our play, In Search of Giants, we're dealing with the search of and discovery of our roots mm. and how that journey can inform our present and influence the future. What are some of the things that we can learn from Henry Bibb uh, as you do this work on silencing his voice and studying his life, his genius? How can we apply what we find uh, about him to our very real present day issues that we are struggling with now? I, I think uh, a big um, part, or, or the way he con conducted his life, was uh, he was committed. He was really committed to the struggle, and and he he never let up. He never backed down. It was that daily application of commitment, or put in another way, he embodied that commitment um, that the work has to be done. Um, we, you know, we can sleep, we can rest, but we have to wake up and continue the work. The commitment was a major uh, piece for me that I see how he and many of the other abolitionists on both sides of the border lived, lived their lives. And another important aspect was um, the struggle for unity. It wasn't easy. Um, within the black community, because here you have the wider community you know, beating down these people, uh, and, and so unity was important, but within the black community there, there were diverse voices, and they did not always agree on, on the strategy, or what strategy was the best for black liberation, and we see that today. Mm -hmm. um, we see a similar thing happening today in how, how we conceptualize or, or even um, the ideas that we have about black emancipation, how we put them into action and into practice. It's, it, it's, it's challenging. And complex. Yeah, yeah. And you, you see that then in the community back in Henry mm -hmm. Bibb's time. But at the end of the day, it, it was a commitment to freedom that superseded everything else. You know, the day Henry Bibb died was August 1st, 1854. August 1st is Emancipation Day in the British um, world. Yeah. Yeah. So because on August 1st, the slaves in the West Indies were, um, the, uh, well, we can say emancipated. And so African Americans and, and Canadians commemorated this act on August first, so we still have August first today, right? Emancipation mm -hmm. Day is celebrated. Mm -hmm. So Bib died on that day. I thought, oh, who chooses August first <laughs> as the day to die. you know <laughs> to die? Like it's mm -hmm. like how perfect <laughs> yeah. you die on Emancipation Day, but he did. Um, it was like a script he, that he, <laughs> he'd written for himself. His whole life was was yeah. Was it like is true. A, like a, it's true. Uh, a novel. Yeah, or, uh, yeah. And in fact, and you, you're absolutely right, I'm going to come back to others first, because when he wrote his narrative, someone, I think it was the James Burney, the white abolitionist who eventually ended, ended up retiring in Michigan, said, oh, it can't be true. It can't be true. This is, this tale is too fantastical. It can't be true. So poor Henry Bino had to get all Perf kind of letters of authentication that he even wrote to his old slave master. <laughs> yes. He said, please tell the world that I was a slave on your plantation. My story is true. Because, you know who, but 
it wasn't unique though. So many people yeah. had that kind of life. Yeah. When we saw the film Twelve Years a Slave and you know that gentleman was kidnapped into slavery. It sounds bizarre. It's true. He was a free man. He was kidnapped into slavery. Um, Solomon Northrop spent 12 years in slavery. So Bibb's life, you know, he, has, he escaped so many times. He's like Houdini. Yes. He kept escaping. He kept getting caught. Mm -hmm. um, he and his wife and child were running in the swamps. Dogs were after them. It's true. You know, so yeah, the August 1st thing was like the, the final dramatic piece. But when he died, um, the black and abolitionist community on both sides of the border had prepared themselves for this celebration, August 1st. They had rented, I believe, George de ba Batiste, or it could be William Lambert, I don't remember, owned a, a sailing vessel called the Ruby. And it was a, a kind of ferry that you can rent and you can have food catered and you sail up and down the Detroit River and, and give toast and you know celebrate Emancipation Day. That was the plan for August 1st. And they died and, and they, cont they did it. They still celebrated August 1st, but they made it a tribute to Henry Bibb on both sides of the border. So here's this craft, the ruby sailing in the middle of the river. There are people on one side, people on the other side. And it was a commemoration of Henry Bibbs' life. Mm. Um, so I thought that was just very beautiful. Theodore Holly um, gave a speech. Um, they, they came over onto the Windsor side, the Canadian side, and, and, and gave condolences to Mary Bibb. It, it, it was very beautiful. And because people knew who he was, both the, the black abolitionists, the white abolitionists, they had worked with him, they were his colleagues, or he was their colleague, and they knew of his commitment to black freedom. Beautiful. I love that story. Yeah. Um, like many, as you say, many people experienced what he experienced, but didn't necessarily write about it, and mm -hmm. with such eloquence. Yeah. Um, uh, I see his narrative, by the way, as, as, this, as a love story. Yes. I just see it as it's a love chant because it, his family was the center yes. and that that makes his narrative unique too because his family was at the center of it. It was Melinda and, and Mary Frances, you know, it was his mother and his six brothers and it was this love story, it was this love story about them mm -hmm. and his relationship with them. Um, that I, I think was the center of his narrative, mm. um, which um, which was, also can yeah. which also can touch us now. Yeah, and and uh, and help us feel that um, that empathy for for the struggle. Yeah, for the struggle to you know what is what is more important our personal freedom or our our love mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. our our relations our yeah. our friends and relations. Yeah. Um, like many, uh, once Henry had freed himself, he actively condemned and uh, countered the system of slavery um, by any means necessary, mm -hmm. as you said in your dissertation. How did Henry's own complex ideas about freedom and integration shift or change over the years? Did, did they change or was he pretty much dedicated to the same path throughout? Was he uh, unfailing in his um, his commitment to that one path? Or did he, uh, you talked about the complexity within the the, the movement of, of different opinions and diverse strategies, you know, how did he shift or change his mind about how that should uh, happen? Well, he certainly was unfailing in his commitment to, mm -hmm. to black freedom. Um, when he was in, in Boston and, um, and, and late, later on in Michigan, when he, but if we look at Boston after, because he lectured in Massachusetts mm -hmm. and New Hampshire, he was all over New England and New York and where he met his, he met Mary Bibb in New York. 
he was pretty he was linked for a while with the Garrisonian abolitionists. That's William Lloyd Garrison and who edited the newspaper mm -hmm. or published the newspaper The Liberator and Boston was their HQ and they were into what was called moral suasion. So this whole idea that slavery will end um, by appealing to the conscience of the slaveholders and, um, <clears throat> and pro-slavery people. So m moral suasion. Uh, we, we're going to convince them if it takes a hundred years, but we're going to convince them that it's wrong and they will release their slaves. Um, so Bib was a lot, and the Garrisonians were very, very strong, mm -hmm. very strong. You know, New England, blue stocking people. And in fact, in Boston and, and New England, many of the Garrisonian abolitionist women, and also in New York, um, they also <laughs> established and created, or, or the colonel for the f women's movement started there, you know, New England, New York, out of this anti-slavery activism. So Bibb was aligned with them for a while through his wife, Mary Bibb, because she, she was a New Englander. Um, but then his ideas around the, the path or the strategy to black freedom changed when he aligned himself with what uh, was called then the political abolitionist. That no, slavery will end through direct political action. Um,